Father, we do just pause and recognize your goodness. We want to sit and receive what is so true, that you're a good God and you do good things. Your good works are displayed throughout creation. History tells of the goodness of God. The Bible reminds us of the goodness of God. Jesus revealed the goodness of God to us. Father, may our hearts be filled up with that awareness when we think about you. May we truly believe that you're a good, good Father. May that strengthen us. May we be secure in the love of God. May we be men who, uh, strong in your goodness, bring your goodness into just, just a dark world. May we overcome evil with good as you empower us by your Spirit. I pray, Father, that tonight you'd use your word to, uh, to equip us once again to strengthen us so that we uh, fight the battle in the Lord's strength, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord, so that we have more tools in our spiritual toolbox to be able to uh, be your men no matter what the challenge is. I pray for, for guys tonight, Lord, to allow the word to do a work in their hearts to, um, to root out the lies of the evil one and to renew our minds and to strengthen our faith. I pray that your word would, would be what we hide in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. I pray, God, that we'd be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. I pray that every man here would experience fully Jesus living in them and through them. We, we invite you, Jesus, to take over our lives in every way and to transform us in every way so that we might be your men, your servants, and that we might not only be victorious with our own Goliaths in our own battles, but we might bring your life to uh, our wives and our family and our neighbors and our friends. May we be uh, the, the witnesses of Christ that shine the light of Jesus everywhere we go. And we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, tonight we're building on what we have started in our first two sessions. There's kind of a flow to our thinking we introduced this whole concept that we're in a battle in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when David stepped into the Elah Valley to face Goliath. And every man faces Goliath. Uh, there is a constant a barrage from the world and the flesh and the devil to kill, steal, and destroy everything that Jesus wants to do in our life. But we're, we're on the winning side. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he came to destroy the works of the devil. And he triumphed over all principalities and powers and spiritual forces in dark places. Jesus Christ has thoroughly triumphed over Satan and his demons. And we are in Christ and Christ is in us. So we have the resources to be winners in the spiritual conflict. We saw this morning that the way that we run to battle is with a big view of God. David saw God as bigger than any Goliath, and because God was so big, Goliath was small. And when we have a big view of God, our Goliath will be small, will be strong in faith. Big thoughts about God will inspire big faith, and big faith will motivate big action. So now we switch to the New Testament, and we take what is uh, the New Testament parallel to the battle belongs to the Lord. It's in Ephesians chapter 6. It's the full armor of God. The way that we face Goliath and the way that we win the spiritual battle is by living life, putting on and taking up the full armor of God. Um, in our church, we have a big men's ministry, and we, we do a lot of uh, uh, things for the guys. One of the things we do in the spring is we put on an event. It's a really big event. We call it Beast Feast. It's real simple. We get a beast and we feast. So uh, we put on steak dinners for all the guys and have milkshakes and full meals as much as they want to eat. And then we get a speaker who's a beast of a man. And we tend to get a guy who is uh, either uh, some type of uh, sports or military figure that is pretty well known and is a dedicated Christian. A couple years ago, we got uh, Lieutenant uh, Jeff Struker, who was really well known for Black Hawk Down. Uh, his life was kind of put on the screen through some Hollywood actor, but Jeff Struker's the real deal. And in the movie Black Hawk Down, it kind of follows what happens to uh, a force of Rangers and Delta Force operators and Black Hawk helicopter pilots in Mogadishu. 
What happened, as we all know, is they went in to do a, a kidnapping mission of a, of a terrorist and got caught up in a firefight in the middle of the town. Several Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopters were shot down. The Rangers had to go in and try to rescue them, and the Rangers got caught in a firefight. Some Delta Force operators went in to go rescue them, and we lost a lot of good men. Um, in that movie, at the very end, when they finally survive that night of all the firefight, and they get out of the city, and they come into the Colosseum where they're finally rescued, they all line up, and they're just exhausted. And then there's this final scene where this one Delta Force operator comes up, and rather than laying out in exhaustion, he goes to a table where there's all this military gear, and he starts picking up night vision goggles, and he starts picking up grenades, and he picks up some ammo packs, and he picks up all these weapons and all these tools, and he puts them on, and he starts to turn around, and the other rangers are saying, what are you doing? And he says, I'm going back in. And that's how the movie ends, because he was a special operator trained to use the equipment to fight the enemy. We need to see ourselves in the spiritual battle like we're in the front lines of the special forces, and we have all the weapons and all the tools and all the equipment provided for us to actually win the battle. And Ephesians chapter 6 walks through the pieces of armor and weapons that God provides so that every one of his men can actually win the, soup, the spiritual battle. God doesn't want us just fighting it. God wants, it win it, wants us winning it. And so he provides everything we need to win the battle. It says this in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So this passage unpacks everything that God provides for us to actually fight and win the spiritual battle. And I just want to walk through it verse by verse and bring out some key observations to help each of us be equipped to know that the battle belongs to the Lord. So here's the first observation, be strong in the Lord. In fact, that's the command of Ephesians 6.10. Uh, 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord. Um, I like the Apostle Paul. He writes the book of Ephesians. He writes five and a half chapters. He gets, he's now in chapter 6, halfway through chapter 6, and he says, finally. In other words, he's letting us know that he's coming to a conclusion, which, by the way, when a pastor says, this is my closing point, never believe him. He's always going to go on for about 15 or 20 more minutes. Um, but Paul says, finally, and it's actually finally. But what it also tells me is that he's been building a case for this final charge. So everything that he's been saying in the first five and a half chapters is preparation for what he's going to say now in these last final verses of the book. And in the last final verses, what he reveals is that we're in this great battle. And in this great spiritual battle, there is a real enemy, but there are real resources that we can avail ourselves to to actually fight and win the battle. And what he says after finally is really important because he's been saying all of the things he said up to this point, and now he says, finally, and almost like if you think there's like a pregnant pause, finally, and this is it, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's a command, by the way. It's not a suggestion. 
And uh, like I will say often in, in, in the church I pastor, when you read the Bible and you see a promise, your response is to claim it. When you read the Bible and you see a truth, your response is to believe it. When you read the Bible and you see a command, your response is to obey it. See, God wants his men to obey this command. It's the only way we're going to win the spiritual battle. And this is one of those cases where a knowledge of the original language kind of opens up some insight in, into this command because this is in what's known in, in the Greek language a present middle imperative. Present means it's, it's an ongoing command. So you don't just get strong in the Lord once, like when you get saved or when you go to a men's retreat. No, it's every day and moment by moment throughout the day. The way we're to live our lives, taking each step of our lives, is to be strong in the Lord. So we need to start every day asking God to give us strength. And multiple times throughout the day, we need to say, Lord, give me strength. It needs to be an ongoing habit that we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. It's a present command. It's a present middle command. There's a unique thing about the Greek grammar where language is described in terms of the, the participant's relationship to the command. So my relationship to the command in a present middle command is it's a reflexive relationship. I'm commanded to do something and to receive something. I'm commanded to strengthen myself in the Lord. God's the one who gives me strength, but I strengthen myself in the Lord. God's the one who gives me strength, but I strengthen myself in the Lord. When I was uh, a, a young guy, as I told you, I played all kinds of sports. I played football primarily. But when I was in high school, I went to, when I was in, a freshman, I was like 5'4 and 130 pounds. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was 5'7. I weighed 150 pounds. When I was a junior in high school, I was 5'8 and I weighed 170 pounds. When I was a senior, I was 5'10 and weighed 200 pounds. 30 pounds my senior year. Well, what happened? I lifted weights like crazy. And I drank these stupid protein shakes that <laughs> Bob Hoffman's gain weight. It was 3,000 uh, calories. It tasted like chalk, but I would make this protein shake. I'd put a raw egg in it. I'd put peanut butter in it. I'd put ice cream in it. I'd put an instant breakfast in it. I put Bob Hoffman's gain weight in it, and I drank it every day. And at night, I would have a big peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a big glass of milk. And then I lifted weights like crazy. When I was, I was a. Uh, uh, Going from junior to senior year, I think I could bench press maybe about 200 pounds my junior year. I bench pressed 300 pounds my senior year in high school. Because I was growing, because I had a natural, any kid, by the way, so it's, any kid at that age has a natural propensity to grow. And if you add to it eating a lot of food and doing a lot of exercise, guess what? You grow with muscle. But I was strengthening myself. See, we spiritually are to strengthen ourselves. God speaks to us through the word, but you can't just go to sleep on it like this and expect to have it in your head. You got to read it. You got to study it. You got to memorize it. And then God speaks to you. You read it, study it, memorize it, and then God speaks to you. You pray, and God talks back to you. Amazing, isn't it? See, you strengthen yourself. That's what it says in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. So the might that we're trying to get into our lives is not self-might, not personality power, but God's power within us. So we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, it says, You therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not so much in my absence, but even more in my presence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. You work out your salvation. That's work for your salvation. It's work out. It's one Greek word, ergazomai. We work out. In other words, taking something that's inside of you and getting it out. What's inside of us? Salvation. Work out your salvation. For God is at work working in. Here's a Christian life, men. We work out what God works in. We work out what God works in. If God working is, if there's no God working in your life, but you're trying to work it out, you're just being religious, trying to do a bunch of stuff for God with no spiritual life and power there. That's just being religious. That's not the Christian life. If God's working it in, but you're not working it out, 
That's just intellectual Christianity. You just, you just know a lot of Bible facts, but that isn't transforming your life or blessing other people. So it's not working it out with no working it in, and it's not working it in with no working it out. It's having God work it in, and you work it out. So strengthen yourself in the Lord. It, you know, um, my first job uh, that, I, that I ever had was a real full-time job as I worked as a physical fitness instructor at Jack LaLanne's European Health Spa. Remember old Jack LaLanne? That dude could do put, jumping jacks all day long and push-ups. I worked as an instructor at, at Jack LaLanne's, and my, my job was to help people kind of get in shape. So guys would come in maybe who'd never worked out before in their life. They'd tell me what it was that they wanted to do, what their goals were, and I'd put together a little exercise program for them to try to get in shape. The guys who worked the program, guess what? They got in shape. The guys who never came in and worked out, they didn't get in shape. Do you know there's people that... Now, if this applies to you, please don't take offense. But there's people who will actually join a gym and never work out. You know, I just had a funny thought. I wonder if there's, if there's people who would, who would say they're Christians but never really go to church or say they're Christians but never read their Bible or say they're Christians but never spend time in prayer or say they're Christians but never seek to grow in the Lord. Nah, that's a silly thought. Anyway, uh, what this passage says is be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. You want to win the spiritual battle, you got to be strong in God's might. And so the first command is be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Because the power, you see, it comes from God. But we receive God's power as we seek it. It's kind of like, um, you know, they got lumber industry up here, I know. Remember the old-fashioned buck saw where it's like a big saw with a big handle on this side and a handle on this side? And two guys use it to, to saw a tree. When this guy pushes... What is this guy doing? Pulling. When this guy pushes, what is this guy doing? Pulling. So in our relationship with God, when we are seeking him, you know what he's doing? He's reaching out to us. When we're seeking him, he's pouring his life into us. When we're praying to him, he's answering us. When we're reading his word, he's speaking to us. When we are surrendering our whole life to him, he's pouring his power of his spirit into us. It's this, we work out what he works in. That's the Christian life. That's growing in Christ. That's strengthening ourselves in the Lord. So he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. See, it's God's might, not, not ours. Remember, David didn't beat Goliath. The Lord did. David was just the human vessel that God chose to work through and show his power. David said the battle belongs to the Lord. And God will win and fight and win our battles when we are strengthening ourselves in him. Um, when my kids were little, like a lot of kids of the past, I don't know how many years, they watched Sesame Street. And they used to be enamored with those characters on Sesame Street. And I remember when they were really little, we bought some of the uh, puppets for the different characters of Sesame Street. And when, when I can remember when my son was just, you know, just really little, and we'd be giving him a bath, and he'd be sitting in the bathtub and have his little toys there in, in the bathtub, and I would take an Ernie puppet, and I'd put my hand in the Ernie puppet, and I'd get down kind of like this on the bathtub, and I'd put, put my hand up like this, and I'd go, oh, hey, Taylor, how you doing? Oh, I see you got a rubber ducky. Have you seen my friend Bert? Hey, what's going on? And he would be enamored with that, with that Ernie puppet. Now, he could see that it was my hand up in Ernie's you know, puppet and doing this and stuff, and he could hear me talking, but he was fascinated, and as a child, it's like the reality was suspended, and he actually thought Ernie was alive, but it was my power in Ernie. You know, some of us think we're alive. We think we've got what it takes, but we don't. It's God in us. In Colossians 1.27, it says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, it's Christ in us. 
But the way we experience Christ in us is we seek to be strong in the Lord. And as we seek to be strong in the Lord, God strengthens us with his power. Here's a second observation. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then it says, put on the full armor of God so that you might take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need to know our enemy. We need to know our enemy. We have a, a real enemy, the devil. The devil is not a Hollywood projection. The devil is not a myth. The devil is a mighty angelic being. The Old Testament tells us that his name was Lucifer. He was the worship leader of the angels, and he was an archangel. But in his pride, he wanted to be like God, and he challenged God's authority. And so he was kicked out of heaven, and he came into this planet, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says he's the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly lived and walked according to the prince of the power of the air who's now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said he's the thief in John 10, 10. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In John chapter 8, Jesus says that he was a liar and the father of lies, said he was a murderer from the beginning. It's the devil in Genesis chapter 3, three who in the form of the serpent tempts Eve and lies to her. And, and, and Adam, who's just, you know, big, dumb, and stupid, goes along with it, and he disobeys God and plunges the entire human race into sin. And now this world system is under the control of the evil one. 1 Peter chapter 5 says he's our adversary who prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Revelation chapter 12 says he's the devil, the serpent, the dragon, who is the accuser of the brethren. So the devil is a real enemy, but he's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not infinite. He's finite. He's created, but he has a whole host of demonic um, forces that align themselves with him, demons. And the Bible refers to demons over and over and over. You cannot read the Gospels. You cannot read the Gospels. I challenge you to do it. I challenge you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and, and come up with a theology does not, that does not include the reality of demons. It, Jesus confronted demons, set people free from demons. Jesus was the bondage breaker. He rebuked demons. Jesus taught about the reality of demons, and the prince of demons, Beelzebub, is Satan himself. So we're in a real spiritual battle. We live in a fallen world system. We have a sin principle within us, the flesh, but we have a real enemy, the devil, and a host of demons. Um, when, when I was like younger, I used to really enjoy these um, mythology movies and, and kind of, they're kind of science fiction movies, but more like movies about the, the, the different Greek gods like Hercules and, and Jason and the Argonauts and those kind of movies. And they, they, um, they made a movie about Jason and the Argonauts. And in, in the movie about Jason and the Argonauts, Jason fights this creature called the Hydra. And the Hydra was like a dragon that had all these different heads. And every time Jason would cut off one of the heads... Another one would grow back. And it wasn't until he actually stabbed it in the heart that he could kill the hydra. Think about Satan and his demons like, like the hydra. They're all these demons, but they're not the ultimate spiritual force of evil. They're Satan himself. But he energizes the demons, and through a demonic attack, through a demonic attack, he seeks to defeat us. Now, even as I just have said that, I just had this thought in my head that there's some of you here that think I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. There's some of you here that think you're talking science fiction, JP. You don't really believe that. That, that, that is so backwards. That, that's, like, um, that's like, you know, unsophisticated, uneducated thinking. If you think that, 
Satan has got you duped because he has you buying into a naturalistic worldview. He, he, he is defeating you by trying to get you to don't, not believe that he actually exists. Because unless you understand who you're fighting, you'll not be able to beat him. And one of Satan's tools is to convince us he doesn't really exist. And that the problems we face are just psychological, not spiritual. And the issues we face are sociological and not spiritual. And that the solutions to the issues we face are natural and not supernatural. And that's a lie. And that's a lie. There is a real devil and there are real demons. And Ephesians chapter 6 is telling us that we are to take our stand against the devil's schemes with an S. That means plural. There isn't one scheme. There are schemes. The Greek word is methodios. Now just listen to that word because a lot of times Greek and Latin words are turned into English words. Methodios. What do you think English word we get from that? Methods. He's got all kinds of methods. See? He's got all kinds of of methods. If he can't get you with lust, he'll get you with pride. If he can't get you with pride, he'll get you with selfishness. If he can't get you with selfishness, he'll get you with uh, unbelief. And he can't get you with unbelief, he'll get you with shame. And that's the ones he'll use all the time. See, he has various methods. So we're to be aware and be on guard and take our stand against the devil's schemes, and we're to be aware of the demonic attack that he wants to assault upon us. And as I mentioned in, our, in my first talk about uh, uh, the, the battle that we're in, Satan primarily uses temptation, accusation, and deception. And I think he uses deception because... It just works. It works. When we are deceived, we think we're believing the truth. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus announces to his men, he has just said to Peter, he's just said to Peter, Peter, you're, you're a rock, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell I can't prevail against it. I'm going to give you guys the keys to the kingdom of God, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is going to be loose in heaven. And then he says, but I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be crucified, and three days later I'm going to rise from the dead. And Peter says, no, Lord, Lord, no, that's not you. That's not going to happen to you. No. And Jesus looks at Peter, who he just called a rock, and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan can put thoughts in our heads that we think are ours or we think are actually godly. And so we champion ideas that are actually demonic because we're believing lies. In 2 T uh, Timothy 2, it says, the Lord bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but he must be kind to all, able to teach, Correcting those who are in opposition, if perchance they might repent from having been held captive to the devil, believing his lies. You know who 2 Timothy is written to? Timothy. You know what Timothy was doing when 2 Timothy was written to him? He was pastor in a church. You know who the people that he's talking to who would be in opposition to him? People in his church. Do you know people in church sometimes can strongly believe ideas that they think are actually godly, but really they're demonic. They're creating division. And that division is coming from a demonic source. And God says, the Lord's bondservant must be kind and able to teach and correct those who are in bondage to satanic deception. See, we as God's men are vulnerable to the spiritual attack of Satan. See, if all we think about, and this is, this is another lie of Satan, it's only demonic if, you know, someone's head spins around in a 360 and green projectile vomit comes out. <laughs> now, Satan is so much more subtle than that. He knows if he operated that way, we'd for sure see it's satanic, and out of fear, we'd get on our knees and pray and start quoting Scripture and ask God to give us victory. So what he does is he lies... And he works subtly through bitterness, 
and pride and lust and false doctrine and we believe lies. And John 8 says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Well, the corollary is also true. If you believe a lie, you're held in bondage. And a lot of God's men are in bondage in certain parts of their life because they're not being set free because they're believing lies. And those lies come from the liar. So Ephesians 6 is telling us how we can be free from that. And first of all, it says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then it says, know your enemy. Know his strategy. Know what he tries to do. The devil's scheme is to deceive us. In fact, listen to some of these. These are just some examples where the Bible talks about deception. Uh, in James 1, 22, it, it says, We've been deceived if we only hear the word of God and don't do it. In 1 John 1, 8, we've been deceived if we say that we don't have any sin. In Galatians 6, 3, we've deceived ourselves if we think we're something when we're actually nothing. In 1 Corinthians 3.18, we've deceived ourselves if we think that we're wise when we're really not. In James 1.26, we've deceived our own heart if we think we're religious, but we don't bridle our own tongue. In Galatians 6.7, we've been deceived if we think we won't reap what we sow. In 1 Corinthians 6.9, we've been deceived if we think that we can live unrighteously and still inherit the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, we've been deceived if we think we can continue to associate with bad company and it not affect us. In 2 Corinthians 11.13, we are deceived when we doubt the word of God and the goodness of God. In Luke 21.18, we're deceived if we believe a false Messiah rather than the true Messiah. And 2 Timothy 3.12, we're deceived if we think the Christian life will be easy. These are just biblical examples of deception. And behind every one of those deceptions is a lie that Satan seeks to implant in one of God's people. And if that lie finds fertile soil, it will begin to take root and produce the fruit of that lie in that person's life. And so God says, I want my men free. So here's a game plan, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm telling you, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And let me tell you about your enemy. This is what you need to know, the way he's going to fight. I, I'm, I'm watching this, uh, this show. It's on uh, PBS right now. It's about Muhammad Ali. It's just fascinating, you know, kind of the, the history of Muhammad Ali, how he grew up and became an Olympic gold medal winner. And then uh, he was Cassius Clay at the time. And then he, he, he turned pro. And then he fought Sonny Liston and became... Then he changed his name to Muhammad Ali and just the whole history. And then it, it, talks, it kind of tells the arc of his, of his story because he had to have an opponent that could really challenge him. And the, the opponent that really challenged Muhammad Ali in three fights was Joe Frazier. And then they had that really big fight, the Thrilla in Manila. Right. So this whole story of Muhammad Ali, and you think about boxing, and the kind of fighter that he was, you know, he floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. Come on, how would... Anyway, he's, he's out there, and if you think, if you think that the spiritual battle is like you're, you're, you're in a boxing ring, and you've got the gloves on, and your opponent has the gloves on, and you're going to, you know, fight by the Marquis of Queenberry's rules, you're in for a big surprise. Because you're going to be in the ring, and you're going to go like this, and the devil's going to come up and go, boom, and kick you right in the nuts. Because he doesn't fight fair. He doesn't fight fair. He's all about destroying us. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5, be on your guard, be on your alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But we don't have to fear the devil. At all. In fact, there's nowhere in the Bible that says fear the devil. It says fear God. If we have a big view of God, if we're strong in the Lord, if we know our enemy, if we put on the full armor of God, we can fight the spiritual battle, and the battle belongs to the Lord, and we can win every time. We got to be strong in the Lord. We got to know our enemy. Here's the third thing put on the full armor of God. 
Verse 11, put on the full armor of God. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you notice in there that it says, stand, stand, stand? I will freely admit, I am not the sharpest Bible student in the world. But if I see in a couple of verses, stand, 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 you know what I know God wants me to do? Stand, not run away. Stand, take my stand. Also, did you notice it didn't say, if the day of evil comes, it says, When the day of evil comes. The day of evil is coming. And for some of us, it has come. And guess what? It'll come again. We're in a real fight. We're in a real spiritual battle. But God's telling us how to win the spiritual battle. And he says, put on the full armor of God. Stand your ground. Stand. Stand firm. The the Greek word for stand is... A word, I'm going to say this word, it's a Greek word, but I bet you've heard it and never even knew that it was a Greek word. It's antihistamine. <laughs> Anybody have any allergies or colds? You ever take a cold and it's said in there it has antihistamines in it? That's a Greek word. It means to stand against. It means it's, any, it's a drug that comes up against whatever you're aller- allergic to. That's what it means. So we are to come up against the forces of evil. We're to stand, we're to stand our ground, we're to stand firm. And how do we do it? By putting on and taking up the full armor of God. Putting on and taking up the full armor of God. So it mentions the full armor. Guys have probably heard a sermon on this a bazillion times. Paul's in a Roman prison. He's, he's at Ephesus. He's, right, he's in Rome. He's writing to the Ephesian church. He's chained to a prison guard. And he's writing about the spiritual resources that we have in Christ to win the battle, he's looking at the guard and going, there's my illustration right there. This guy's fully armored to fight a physical battle. We're fully armored to fight a spiritual battle. We got the same pieces of armor. So he says, put on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and put on the shoes of the gospel and take the shield of faith and have the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit. Now you're fully equipped. But think about what it is we have. Don't think about the armor. Think about what we have in Christ. We got truth. We have the truth. And what is the truth true? It sets you free. Satan lies to you. You can speak the truth and it'll set you free. You don't have to believe his lies. You can speak back to every lie with the truth. That's exactly what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 in the wilderness when he's tempted by Satan. He spoke the truth back to, to the devil. You got the truth. You got the breastplate of righteousness. You know what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Every believer is as righteous as Jesus Christ. Right now. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you did today. I don't care what you've been thinking while I am speaking. Right now, if you're a believer, you're, you have the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's ours. It's, it's, it's our birthright. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Justified is the same word as righteous. Justice and righteousness are the same. Uh, they're the English translation is the same Greek word. It's the Greek word dike, which is righteous. Dike asune, which is righteousness. Dike ao, which is to justify or to declare righteous. Every believer is declared righteous in Jesus Christ. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. So, Got truth, got righteousness, got the gospel of peace. Got your feet shod with the gospel of peace. The, the, the Roman soldier, that was one of the pieces, it's a little known fact, but one of the main reasons the Roman army was super successful is they used to fight these barbarians that didn't wear anything on their feet. They're barefoot. 
and they'd slip and slide in mud. The Roman soldier wore a hobnail sandal. It was leather bound around their foot and their leg, and on the bottom of it were pieces of bone and metal. It was like wearing cleats. Think about in a football game if you're playing against a team and they're barefoot and it's on a mud bowl. Man, you just drive off the line and you just drive them all the way down the field. The Roman soldiers would take their stand and could actually get traction because of the footwear. We have the gospel as our footwear. So we got the truth, we got righteousness, we got the gospel, we got the shield of faith. The, the, the Roman soldier had two shields. One was a small shield. That's the one we usually see in like gladiator movies, small circular shield. shield. But this was the larger shield. That's the word for the larger shield, which was about the size of a door. And it was covered in leather. And oftentimes they would soak the leather in, in water because in the ancient world in battle, the, the uh, artillery that they had were arrows. They would often dip them in pitch and light them on fire and shoot these flaming arrows. And we have the shield of faith, which extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. So the evil one is shooting those, those accusations. He's shooting those temptations. He's shooting those lies at us. And what do we have to stop him? The shield of faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in the Word of God, that's what distinguishes all those attacks of the evil one. We were having a conversation uh, earlier before this session. I talked about the fact that if you take one, think about a, a shield that big, like the size of a door, and then cover it in leather and then soak it in water, and you lift it up, you're in the midst of a battle holding that up for a while. What's going to happen? Your arm is going to get pretty tired. Your shoulder is about to cramp. So you know what the Roman soldiers did? They fought in what's called a phalanx formation. A phalanx was all the way across in the front, linked up, and then all the way to the side. And the, the, the shields were, were equipped on the side with a tongue and groove design so that this shield had a groove on this side, but the shield over here had a male section coming out, and then it was the opposite, and it was the opposite of the opposite. So they're fighting as individuals, but then when the enemy would come at them, they could take those shields and link them up and lock shields. And the guy next to me would have his shield locked to me, and the guy next to him would have his shield locked to me. And so now all of our strength together could raise those. And then we'd march and take the battle to the enemy. So God has designed us to lock shields with one another. That's why we need one another in the Christian life. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. We need a brother on this side. We need a brother on this side. But we need the shield of faith. We need to believe what we believe. So we got, we got the truth. We got righteousness. We got the gospel. We got the shield of faith. We got the helmet of our salvation. That's what protects the vital part. The head uh, uh, is, is like the most vulnerable part in a battle. The, the head's protected by salvation. That's why it is not uncommon for someone to question or doubt their salvation. Where do you think that comes from? The evil one trying to attack them. So what God says is, be secure in your salvation. Know that you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Be certain that you understand you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's not because of what you did, it's because of what Christ did. And you're solid on that. And so you have... You have truth and you have righteousness and you have the gospel and you got faith and you got salvation and then you got the sword of the spirit which is the word of God see it's the armor that protects us with that armor Satan could fire every one of his missiles at us but we're protected you ever seen one of those uh, one of those suits that, that the, the, the dog trainers wear that are training attack dogs you know, and it's like they're totally covered up and that dog is trying to bite at something, but every place is completely covered up, right? Because they're trying to protect themselves from an attacking dog. We need protection in the spiritual battle and we have all the protection we need through the full armor of God. But that's not the end of the story. Because you don't win a fight by only playing defense. you got to take it to the enemy. See, God not only wants us to be protected from the enemy's onslaught, he wants to advance the kingdom. He, he wants the message of the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. 
He wants his righteousness to extend not only from us, but to our wives and to our kids and to our neighbors and to our community. He wants his true life to spread. So God gives us weapons that we use to be on the offensive. So we got to be strong in the Lord. We've got to know our enemy. We've got to put on the full armor of God. And lastly, we've got to fight with God's weapons. Verse 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. And pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Our first weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. The Roman soldier had two swords. One was a big kind of like a broad sword, and the other was a short, like a, a long dagger. And it's the word, it's the Greek word for that short dagger, which means the sword that we have to take to the enemy, you can't defeat him like this. You've got to be up close and personal to give a death blow. You've got to be actually in the fight. That's why you can't run away from the battle. You've got to run to the battle. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And it's not the logos of God. That's a Greek word for word. It says in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word, and the Word was God. And all things came into being through Him, and nothing came into being apart from Him. It's talking about Jesus. He's the logos of God. That's not the word for word in Ephesians 6. It's the word rhema. And rhema was the spoken or specific word or personal word. So the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God that enables us to take the battle to the enemy, is that specific word from God that applies to the specific spiritual situation that we're in, the specific battle that we're in, the specific Goliath that we're facing, the word that speaks right to that Goliath. So... In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is confronted by the temptations of the evil one and, and the devil says, turn these breads, the, these stones into bread, Jesus didn't quote Isaiah 321. You know what Isaiah 321 says? Finger rings and nose rings. It's an actual verse in the Bible because I, I memorized it. Finger rings and nose rings. It's a list of all these garments and, and apparel that people are wearing. Jesus didn't go, finger rings and nose rings. And the devil went, oh, I better leave. No, he, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, he spoke the word that was relevant and meaningful to that situation. That's the rhema of God. So it's not picking up the Bible and saying, okay, man, I'm going to go duke it out with the devil. No, it's having the specific words of Scripture imprinted on your heart so that you can speak them out when the devil tries to attack you. Now, I, I just think about that for a moment, guys. For, for us to be men who can, in the moment of a crisis of spiritual attack, draw upon a Scripture, which is the rhema of God, claim it and speak it, to the situation, that means we got to know the word. You, you got to know this book. There's no shortcut. If there was a shortcut, I'd tell you the shortcut because I'd be following it. You know, I was talking a little bit earlier in my message talking about working out and we, we work out what God works in and, and when you work out, you get in shape. If you go to the gym, I, I just, hey guys, Trust me on this. If you go into a gym and you see some dude that's all yoked up and he's got muscles upon muscles, he didn't walk out of the womb looking like that. <laughs> that guy's been spending a lot of time working out. When you see a godly man who demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit, who lives in obedience to Scripture, who's able to resist the devil's temptation with specific words, from God, it's not just that they're a gifted person. They spend time 
studying this book, hiding this book in their heart so that it could be quick on their mouth and so they could put it into practice in their life. Um, there, there's no shortcut. People will come to, up to me, and I've had people ask me this in church. I've had students ask me this in, in Bible college. You know, what's the best translation of the Bible? And I'll say, the one you'll read. <laughs> if you'll read the NIV, that's the best translation. If you'll read the King James, that's the best translation. If you'll read the New American Standard, that's the best translation. If you'll read the, the ESV, that's the best. Tra- the one you'll actually read and study, that's the best. I, I'll, I've had people say to me, how do you memorize Scripture? Because I've heard you talk, and probably 10 or 12, 15 verses just came out. I memorized them. No, but how'd you do it? I, I memorized them. <laughs> now, how'd you do it? Well, I, I opened it up, and I read it, and I said it, and I read it, and I said it, I read it, and I said it, I said it, I said it, I read it, and I said it, I read it, and I said it, I said it, I said it. I wrote it down on a three-by-five card. I put it in my pocket. I looked at it. I read it, and I said it. I read it, I said it, I read it, and I said it to where I had it memorized. There, there's no shortcut. But here's, here's this, because, you know, okay, and I, I, if we put every guy here on a scale and somehow we could do the science on the brain and who has a better memory than others, there'd be some here who had a better capacity to memorize stuff than other people. Okay, I'll grant you that. But we all can memorize stuff. We all do. We all have memorized stuff. Think about the useless stuff you memorized from school. Kingdom phylum, class order, family, genus, species. 1971 biology. I remember that. When two parallel lines are intersected by a transversal, alternate interior angles are equal. High school geometry. Okay, I'll give you one even better. I am an acne pimple, as lonely as can be. Don't cry, pimple. I'll keep you company. Say fellow pimples, would they be a crowd? All together, pimples sing real loud. Na 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 na. That was a Clearasil commercial from the 1960s. <laughs> hey, it's not just me. Plop plop, fizz fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. Okay. R-O-L-A-I-D-S spells, there you go. See, we, re- we just learn stuff. We memorize stuff. We memorize phone numbers. We memorize little jingles. We memorize lyrics. Sometimes we memorize things because we want to. Sometimes we just memorize stuff. I-, 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 I wish I could get this out of my head, but I memorized it. I said a hip, hop, a hibbity, a hibbity, a hip, hip, hop. You don't stop rocking to the bang, bang, boogie. Say up, jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to be. I am one to Mike, and I'm here to say hello to the black, to the brown, to the red and the blue, to the purple and yellow. Now, first on the mic is my man Hank. Come on, Hank, sing that song. Check it out. It's Rapper's Delight from 1980. Why do I know that? I just, I remember, yeah. You know, so we just memorize stuff. All I'm saying is, Take that God-given capacity and discipline it towards something that'll change your life. The sword of the Spirit. It's, it's, the, it's the Word of God. And I love that scene in Gladiator where, where you know, they take Maximus out. It's at the very beginning of the movie. He's betrayed, and he's, they're going to take him out, and they're going to kill him. And the soldier, it's early in the morning, and he's down on his knees with his hands behind his back, and the soldier is supposed to take his sword out of the scabbard and, and chop uh, his head off, and he goes to, to take it out, and he, and he can't get the sword out. And Maximus looks up at him and said, It's the frost. It makes the blade stick. And then he jumps up, knocks the guy over, gets the sword, kills him, and he's free. So what we learn from that is Maximus had an understanding of the sword. In the frosty morning, it gets stuck in the scabbard. But he didn't just understand things about the sword. He knew how to actually use it. We need both. We need to understand things about the word, but we need to know how to to actually use it. Because it's the sword of the Spirit. And then he says, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. And then he says, pray in the Spirit. Because these are weapons. So you got the Word. And what's the one-two punch with the Word? Prayer. Pray in the Spirit. And pray for all the saints. And pray with all prayer and all kinds of petition. In other words, there's a lot of different ways how to, how to pray. But 
Pray in the Spirit. Pray with reliance and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And pray for one another. That's intercessory prayer. So just think about the dynamic here. If each guy here was praying for a different guy, then everybody would be prayed for. And we'd all have the support of one another's prayers. So the word and prayer, and then what does he say? And then he says, oh, and by the way, pray for me. That's not a selfish thing Paul is saying. It's God's called me to a mission. So he says, pray for me. And what he says is, pray for me to share the gospel boldly and fearlessly. So what's, what's our game plan for taking the, the attack to the enemy? Well, we got the sword of the Spirit. We are to be men of prayer, and we're to be praying for one another to share the gospel. And if you can't think of somebody to pray for to share the gospel, pray for me. I would love it if you guys just remember sometime you think, Lord, bless JP, fill him with the Spirit, use him to preach the gospel, because I want to tell people about Jesus. Lord, if he's sitting in a jacuzzi right now, give him the words to talk to that guy. And share the gospel. See, that's, that's where we take the battle to the enemy because in the final analysis, it's heaven or hell. And Satan wants as many people to hell as he can get, and God wants as many people as in heaven as he can get. So he says, use the word, pray, and share the gospel boldly. And when we do that, we advance the kingdom. And by the way, this is, this is just first JP, so take it for this. When my focus about my Christian life, so I'm just thinking about me, when my focus on my Christian life isn't on me and protecting myself, but it's on serving God and serving others, I, the devil didn't have an opportunity to get at me. But if I'm self-focused, oh, I've got to protect myself over here, got to protect myself over here, got to protect myself. See, I'm kind of doing this. I'm retreating. I'm backing up. And that doesn't wait. God wants us to fight the spiritual battle. He wants us to run to, to the battle. So be strong in the Lord. Know your enemy. Put on the full armor of God and take the weapons. Take the weapons that God gives you and take them to the enemy. And that's how we fight and win the spiritual battle. Father... I pray for each of us as men. We, I'm just tired of the devil kicking our butts and, and, and tired of, 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 of being tired. Lord, fill us with the Spirit. Give us hope. Give us all the strength we need. Let us be men who strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Let us put on all the full armor of God. Let us lock shields with one another. Bring men into our lives who will encourage us and build us up and stand side by side with us. And, and Lord, give us victory. Help, help us see how our enemy is a liar. Help us recognize his lies and speak against them with the truth. Lord, give us the, the grace to every day be, be picking up our weapons and, and using all that you give us to win the battle. Um, the battle belongs to the Lord. So fight it for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.